Jesus of Faith. All right, so we are um, in First Corinthians uh, chapter one, and we've been dealing uh, in this chapter. Uh, we've talked about, um, uh, first of all, before we begin, um, you know, this is one of um, um, Paul's letters. Uh, and what do we know uh, about Paul, the Apostle Paul? Start there real quickly. Yes. All right. Actually, before he was named Paul, he was Saul. He was a persecutor of Jews. But we know this in the, in the uh, book of Acts. Right, uh, as he was going to Damascus, uh, and that's where his conversion uh, took place. And not only did his conversion take place, uh, but there was a, um, a name change uh, as well uh, for him. Uh, so one who was the persecutor of, of, uh, of the Jews, uh, those who pro profess um, Jesus Christ, um, that uh, he now becomes this, uh, this proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ and spreads this word uh, of Jesus. Uh, but we find now, and I mentioned that I wanted to start off with that, just to kind of remind us again of uh, who Paul was. And again, he wasn't one of the original uh, of the 12 disciples, but he does become an, a, a disciple of Christ and then the apostle of Christ um, at, uh, at a later, uh, later time uh, in his ministry. Uh, and now we find him, he writes this letter to, uh, to the church of Corinth, to the believers in Corinth. Uh, this is one of his letters or uh, epistles. Paul has uh, written, uh, and we say, 13 that are contributed uh, to him, letters, uh, the, the epistles that are contributed to him. And Corinthians is one, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians uh, is the first letter to the church of Corinth, the believers in Corinth. And then 2 Corinthians is the second letter that he writes uh, to the uh, church of Corinth or the people of Corinth. So we look at 1 Corinthians, um, and this chapter 1 is dealing with uh, wisdom, true wisdom. And um, the other thing I was going to make mention of, even though Paul is, is dealing with um, this, this true wisdom that comes from the divine, that, that comes from the spirit um, of God, um, we also have to understand that, uh, that there is a book of wisdom, right? And uh, what is the book of wisdom? The Bible, wonderful, yes. So we have a book uh, of wisdom, uh, but then Paul uh, stresses the fact that if we're ever going to have uh, the wisdom of God, uh, or true wisdom, it has to come by God through Holy Spirit, okay? All right, so let's... Um, if you look at the screen very quickly, there's a, a little uh, introductional um, uh, piece that I want to uh, start off with. I found this quote, um, and it says, God, uh, God got it. And it says, listen to your elders, not because they're always right, but they have more experience at being wrong. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute and, uh, <laughs> and could be and true, right? When you... When you, when you have experienced life and uh, you've gone through life, uh, you can certainly pick up some things that uh, you may have done uh, or what may have done differently, and uh, you can show, share that with uh, the, the next generation. Uh, if they want to hear it or not, at least you just tell them that uh, I tried that, it didn't work, you may want to try this, right? So wisdom, part of wisdom, and we're going to talk about this not only in Bible study this morning, but in the sermon, True wisdom really comes from uh, not only just experience, but it's from other elements as well that gathered together produces wisdom. All right, the next slide is, the, uh, is a chart or diagram that was in our Sunday school book uh, that talks about God's wisdom, not the, not the world's. And if you look on the left side, it says worldly wisdom is pride, boasting, uh, it is being sophistication, uh, being sophisticated. And, uh, and material success. And if you look at the other side, which talks about godly wisdom, it talks about this humility, 
of devotion, service, uh, and compassion. All right, the next slide. Uh, so we're going to look at the um, three areas uh, of our text, talking about the issue, um, who is saved, and then we're going to look at how are they saved. All right, so the first part is the issue. Um, and so if someone can read for us uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, starting at verse 17 to 19, and we're going to look at what the issue is. Verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Okay. All right, so let's look at, so what is now this issue in this text, in these little verses? First of all, let's look at Paul. Paul starts off uh, the letter by saying, for Christ sent me, right? And that's why I started off with this, who was Paul, and him going from a disciple to being the apostle, which is one who is sent. So Paul starts off with not only his authority, uh, but also his role in what God has called him to do. He says, Christ has sent me. And the purpose of him sending me uh, is not to, he says, not to baptize. Now, one would think that, isn't that what <laughs> the gospel is all about? It's bringing folks to Christ and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Paul says, that's not what the, he's called me to do. That, that's not my purpose. Uh, and this is a good, good segue here just to talk about the purpose, right? God calls us, he sends us, each of us, with a purpose. We all have our own individual ministries, our own individual gifts, um, and talents that God has gifted us with, and we use that uh, according to his will and his purpose for our lives. So for the Apostle Paul, his purpose uh, is to spread the gospel, right? Uh, and he made it very clear, I'm not here to baptize y'all, you know, you can baptize each other. I'm here to give you the gospel, give you the word of God, that you may be able to uh, baptize uh, one another. Uh, so he wasn't concerned about the baptism because he was more concerned about what? The word, the gospel that the, that the Lord has given unto him to give to uh, these those in Corinth. And why is that so important? Because go back to uh, what the issue really was with them, right? And so these are people who um, have turned, some of them, many of them, turned from God. And they have been uh, practicing their own rituals and, uh, and, and, and worshiping idols, and uh, they believed not in the resurrection of Christ, uh, many of them. And so Paul was dealing with the, their practices and their beliefs uh, and their belief systems, uh, and then he was addressing that. He was like, look, you all are lot relying on your own intelligence. You're trying to figure this out for yourselves. He says, but you got to line yourself up with the word of God. So that's why Paul is coming. He's coming because there's this division within the church. Where everyone's trying to do what they want to do. And Paul is like, wait a minute. We have to line ourselves up with the word of God. All right. So that's why he says, but I come uh, to preach this gospel. And here is not with wisdom of words. Right? So, so I'm, not, I'm not bringing you this gospel with this eloquent uh, speech. You know, I'm, you ever uh, uh, sometimes um, we, they t teach us in seminary. Know your audience. Know your people that you're preaching to. And so I wouldn't go into a, a, a church or, or, or an environment where I know that a uh, majority of the folks, if not all of them, are uh, maybe not, uh, not educated, right? Uh, so I don't want to go in and preach with these, you know, these big words and folks are looking at me like, what is he saying, right? Or I wouldn't go in front of young people uh, preaching uh, and, uh, and my speech and the language I'm using is just way above their heads and they can't get it, right? That defeats the purpose of preaching the gospel. And so a pastor or a preacher must really understand and know the audience in which uh, one is preaching. Now, if I have a whole bunch of pastors in here, then my preaching is going to be a little bit different compared to a congregation that there's, there are no pastors I'm preaching to, I'm preaching to lay people, right? Uh, so there's no one on it. So Paul knew his audience, right? Paul knew 
who he was dealing with. And so Paul says, look, I'm not come, I'm not come to you with fancy language, um, knowing more than you, right? Uh, but he says, but what I do know, I'm going to share with you, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, all right? Um, so that's the issue. 18 says, for the preaching of the cross is to them uh, that perish uh, foolishness, uh, but uh, unto us which are saved, it is the power of God, all right? And so in essence, Paul is saying to them is that when you don't receive the gospel of Christ, of Jesus, um, you, you know, it's foolishness, right? You're thinking that what I'm preaching is foolishness, but what you're doing uh, that doesn't line up with the word of God is foolishness, right? And so Paul is, um, is telling them that if you're ever going to experience uh, the power of God, you really have to line yourself up with the word of God, all right? Um, so Paul, uh, in this, let me uh, summarize this, as Paul was uh, un apologetic about the gospel he preached and, um, and which the Corinthians uh, believers had received. Because of its great power, there was no reason for Paul to use human eloquence or wisdom in his preaching. The gospel, which the world considers foolishness, is in reality God's wisdom for man's salvation. God's all God's ways are not man's ways. They have turned to human wisdom rather than God. All right, so there's this difference between the wisdom that we rely on from ourselves, then there's the wisdom that we rely on from God, right? Man's wisdom versus God's wisdom. And, and Paul is addressing that issue. They're relying on their own wisdom. And why is that problematic? Why do you think that's a problem? That they're relying on their own wisdom. What's the danger in that? Any guidance? What do you think? What do you thought? Pastor Curran? Okay, relying on your own wisdom doesn't show your faith in God, more faith in yourself. Okay. All right. Uh, yes? Wisdom, wisdom comes from God. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's their own wisdom, then it's, it's just theirs and not God's. Yeah, which means that there's, there could be some error in our own wisdom, right? Uh, because it's not godly wisdom. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, if God created us in his, in his image and in his likeness, um, then therefore what he has created, he has also imparted in us. Um, his Holy Spirit, the, the, the pneuma of God, uh, the breath of life that's been put in us. And part of that breath of life or part of that life is, you know, the wisdom of God. Right? So God does give us wisdom, right? When he created us, he poured that into us along with other things. And we have to be able to uh, embrace or tap into the wisdom of God through uh, his Holy Spirit. So realizing that I'm not operating out of my own wisdom, but I'm operating out of the wisdom of God, right? And so the next question is then is, how do we get the wisdom of God? Yeah. Reading, studying his word. Then you have to ask. Yeah. You have to ask God for wisdom. Yeah, ask God for his wisdom. Right? So reading the word of God and asking God for his wisdom. Um, and then the, then the next question is, then how do you know is God's wisdom and your wisdom? And part of that is knowing yourself. Right? I always tell people that self-examination, that self-assessment is always important because when we are faced with something, we need the, need the wisdom of God or the understanding of God. We have to determine the difference between our voice and his voice. Right? Um, and so and that, takes, that takes prayer and that takes you know, learning the word of God and studying the word of God and, and spending time with God so you can identify what his voice is versus your own voice. All right. Uh, the next slide talks about um, who, is, uh, who is saved, and that's in verses 20 uh, through 25. Uh, let's get another reader to read that portion of the text, verses 20 and through 25. Get another reader. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. 
It pleased God by foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay. So Paul now asks this question, and the question is, he says, well, where, I'm talking about those wise, well, where is wise, right? Um, he's, he's, he's questioning the believers. Um, now, all of you that are around here and all of that, that is taking place and, and the understanding of what you have regarding your practices um, that is foolish, according to the word of God, um, as they're thinking Paul's message is foolish, Paul is thinking, is, is knowing, he's not thinking, he knows that their practices is foolish. And so he said, well, well, where is the wise among you? If you believe in God um, and the power of God, but your actions don't line up with what you, what you say you believe. Right? And so he questions them, right? where, is this, where is the wise? Where is the scribes? And why does, he, why does he question the scribes? Who are the scribes? Yeah, they're the writers. The writers of the law. Um, and so he's, he's, he's asking questions question that those who write this law, uh, you would think that would be wise because they're the ones that are writing it. And so he's not questioning. He's getting more in detail. Not only where are the wise, but where are these folks that wrote these policies, these, these, these procedures, if you will, these laws that you all uh, are, are, are following, um, and that many of it does not line up with, uh, with the will of God or God's word or God's law. So he's questioning them. Um, and then those who are the dis disputers of this world, right? There's always folk. What, what does he talk about there? So he questions the wise, where are they? He questions the scribes, where are they? Now the disputers. Who, are the, who is he referring to? What are your thoughts? Non-believers. Mm -hmm. Non-believers. Okay, the non-believers. You know, people who, uh, when the message goes out, there's always somebody saying, oh, no, I, I don't believe that. You know, uh, there's always someone that's always trying to challenge the message of the word, uh, word of God, right? Um, you know, we got people nowadays that they want to believe in the universe, and they worship the universe, right? Um, that's not what the Lord, he made the universe, but he didn't tell us to worship the universe, right? Um, and so we have where Paul is trying to get down to, you know, their understanding of who they know God to be. Right? And, and you're supposed to be believers, you're supposed to be uh, these Jews, and, and you're supposed to have an understanding of the power of God but yet I'm coming to give you some, um, some words of wisdom, if you will, um, that would help you. 22 says that then the Jews required a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. All right, let's talk about that very quickly. So why, why does he say the Jews require a sign? Verse, and the Greeks, uh, they seek after wisdom. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. They, they were a people that had to see, right? They didn't believe unless they saw. Right? So they would always ask for, well, give us a sign, and then they'll believe. Right? And uh huh. What is that? A miraculous sign, right? Uh, and sometimes we, you know, we we believe that even today that people who won't believe unless you show them something. You know, I won't believe that he's a healer until he's either healed me or. <laughs> He's healed somebody that, uh, that's close to me. I need a sign. You know, I need, I need to see something, right? Um, which, which, which we talk about Hebrews 11 and 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That talks about our faith, that if we need to always see a sign, then what's, what's the purpose of having faith, right? If we always have to ask God, show me something in order for me to believe it. And there's times that he does show us things, but then there are times where he won't show us. We just got to walk in our faith right, and just believe. Uh, and the Greeks, you know, they seek after wisdom. Why is that? Yeah, Greeks are all philosophers, right? Uh, when I, I was in seminary, 
um, they, one of the things they taught us uh, is the Greek philosophy. Right? So we, we had to learn um, different uh, philosophers um, and, and, and take what they, uh, what they uh, the ideologies and how does that connect then with uh, scripture, all right? When we talk about uh, the Old Testament being of, um, of Hebrew um, and then the New Testament being of Greek, right? And so Greek writings. So what are these Greek writings, what are these Greek philosophers saying in regards to um, uh, the biblical text? All right, so Greeks, they, they seek after having this knowledge, having this wisdom um, that uh, on a particular uh, particular subject. So when you talk about uh, divorce, so when you talk about uh, marriage, and when we talk about um, um, you know this um, uh, worshiping idols and stuff, there were philosophies that were put in place that people followed, and that's what Paul was addressing. Um, he says, "You're you're you're after your own wisdom, right, uh, amongst one another, but you got to look at the wisdom, you know, of God." And he keeps repeating that. And uh, verse 23, he says, but we preach, here it is, Christ crucified, right? This way now he goes into what the godly wisdom ought to be. We, pray, we preach God, God crucified, Christ crucified unto the Jews as a um, as stumbling block and unto the Greeks as foolishness, all right? So because they didn't believe in this dying of Christ and this resurrection of Christ, they have problems with the philosophy uh, and the ideologies uh, centered around that, but Paul is coming as a, a vessel of God, a messenger of God, uh, to give them the word of God. All right. Uh, so who is saved? Uh, those who are considered wise, uh, but, wor but worldly standards had rejected the gospel of, as foolishness, but those who were humble in their thinking had been saved by it. So Paul just says, look, my job, again, I am not coming to baptize you and emerge you into the water. He said, I just came so that you're, the gospel that you, you are rejecting as you're considering it to be foolish, uh, that those who have received this message that comes from me will now have a change of mind, a change of heart, and now be wise enough to follow the message of Christ. Right? This message of the cross is uh, intellectually unacceptable by both Jews and Gentiles, but to those who are saved by it, the gospel is both the power and is the wisdom of God. All right. So then there, the power of God doesn't manifest itself unless the believer receives the power of God, right? receives the message, which is the power of God, uh, which says to us that those that are saved are those who receive the message, which means that now you're receiving the wisdom of God, to make the decision to say that it is God's power through salvation that saves us. The last part of this is then how are they saved? So now we know that the one that Paul is addressing um, are those who, um, these are believers, but they just have, they just, have some other ideologies that they were following and philosophies that they were following. And now Paul is preaching this message and now not all of them, but some of them are now hearing the word of God and now making a, a, a different decision for themselves on what they're hearing, okay? Uh, now the question is how are they saved? Verse 26 and 28, can someone read that very quickly for us? Six, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that n not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Okay. 
All right, so the believers uh, at Corinth were not saved by following human wisdom. Rather, uh, it was God who called them. All right, that's the calling piece. So where we said, verse 27, but God had chosen them, verse 26, rather, for y you see your calling. All right, so Paul reverts it back to them. Now that I've preached this gospel, now that I've given you uh, this wisdom, um, now it's up to you to receive it. You know, and, and so Paul says, now you, now it's up to you as the believer. Uh, you uh, have to see your calling. If you can't see it, Paul says, in other words, then uh, how can I continue to give it to you? You have to be able to see it for yourself. Right? Uh, this is not something that someone can see for you. All Paul says is I can give it to you, and you have to believe it. And part of seeing it is believing it. All right? Uh, so rather, uh, it is God who called and chose them through the preaching of the gospel. Right? So it's them receiving it through the calling, but then it's also God um, uh, choosing them based on them also receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in essence, that God, in essence, God through Paul is saying, I'm not going to choose you or call you unless you believe in the gospel. That it is the power of God that gives us um, the wisdom that we need in order to, uh, to survive. So most of them were not wise. Um, they were not uh, influential or noble by worldly standards. But they were saved. And while the wise and the influential and the noble remained in their sins and under God's righteous um, wrath, all right, so po folks had a choice, is what Paul is indicating in this epistle. Folks had a choice to either receive or not to receive, and it was very evident uh, based on their, um, their response to the message of God uh, where they stand. Okay? Uh, the last part of this uh, is why are, they, uh, why are they saved, and that's verses 29 through 30. And this will be the last piece. Uh, let's have one more reader to uh, read that section for us. And then we'll conclude. Anybody has it? Okay, if not, I'll just read it. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Uh, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. All right, so God's redemptive plan is designed to negate all the human boasting and to maximize his own glory. Salvation is all of God. All right, so that's the last piece of this, is that, that no flesh should glory uh, in the presence of God. Because when the presence of God is with us, it gives us the wisdom. And so when we have the wisdom of God to make the right choices and to be successful and to be um, the people of God that God has called us to be, we're not glorying in ourselves and what God has done. But wisdom says, I could not do it by myself. I needed God in the midst of it. All right. So all that I am, all that I've accomplished in life, um, and I didn't always make good decisions, right? None of us have always made good decisions, but the decisions that we have made, uh, that we relied on God for, that uh, we don't glory in it, right? Well, we give God all the glory, you know, and, and the praise, you know, out of it. So that's why we are saved. We're saved that God, that we don't get the glory for being saved, but God gets the glory for saving us. All right, the closing of the lesson, this is the last piece, the facts, the principles, and the application. Um, so the facts is to note that sharp contrast between God's wisdom and the uh, purpose, um, uh, sophistication of the world. Uh, the principle is to understand that God's wisdom in the gospel is foolishness in the eyes of the world, but the worldly wisdom is powerless to save anyone. So our wisdom alone can't save anyone, but it's with God's wisdom that saves. Application to devote ourselves to the godly wisdom of the saving 
gospel rather than become obsessed with gaining merely worldly sophistication, uh, which leads to pride and can save no one. Right? So there's nothing wrong with being educated, but it's just how we use our education um, in regards to uh, if we use it to just develop ourselves um, and thinking that we did it and not give credit to God uh, for um, giving us the education that we have. And part of wisdom, and we'll learn more, I'll talk more about this and preach more about this in the sermon this morning, but part of wisdom is just not the education. Right? There's, there's other pieces and other elements, which I'll talk about later, that pull together, it, um, it, um, it produces the wisdom with the, with the added presence of, um, of the Almighty God. All right? So God has equipped us with necessary tools that would um, help us to be people of God who operate in the wisdom of God. All right. Okay. All right, so let's pause there uh, in our lesson today. And I think this is, was a really important lesson. Um, I think all, all the Word of God is important. Uh, but particularly, you know, sometimes uh, we do rely on our own uh, wisdom at times. And I think this lesson really helps us to grab a hold of the essence of the, the necessity of having an, uh, the presence of God always evident in our lives uh, that it produces and helps us to make um, the right decisions in our lives. And so I think that's, a, that's the important part of takeaway from this, uh, this lesson. All right, next week, uh, March 20th, um, is we're talking about Christ, our only foundation. All right, so we're going to look at the foundation of our faith, foundation um, of our lives, and the importance of Christ being the foundation. All right, so that's, we're still in uh, Corinthians. We'll be 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, the text is uh, pointing us to verses 10 to 23, but I always encourage us to read the whole chapter to get an essence of what Paul uh, is writing about and why is he writing and who is he writing to and for what reason, all right? So as we're following this, kind of look at the theme of the, the, the outline of his letter to the Corinthian church, uh, to the believer, because uh, he starts off in his letter uh, greeting them and thanking them. Um, then he moves into uh, talking about uh, the division and what divides the church. Uh, and now he moves into the next section of his letter talking about the importance of godly wisdom, you know, and the presence of God and the spirit of God being that, that portion of wisdom that we ought to have and not relying on our own selves, all right? So you can see how his letter is kind of moving, and he doesn't start off in the beginning of his letter talking about, you ought to be wise, right? He doesn't jump at them, if you will, or um, starts correcting them off that, but he kind of smooths his way through this, right? He greets them. Which, which, which says something with, about us, like as believers, when we see that someone is not doing right or someone is not, uh, is, 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 uh, could be doing better for themselves, you know, oftentimes I know we kind of we kind of go at them and, uh, and we just yell or we scream or we get upset um, or our, our tone um, is, um, is, uh, is of negative. But look how Paul treats the, the people, the, the believers. He doesn't just come, you know, angry at them or upset with them, but he greets them with Christian love, and then he talks about how thankful he is um, that God is, is using him and thankful that God is keeping them, um, and then he spreads the wisdom and knowledge, and he says, well, let me tell you something, right, um, that what you're doing is not lining up in the word of God, but it's okay, you know, but you can, we can fix this, all right, so that's the spirit that Paul, that Paul comes with, and uh, he comes to give them um, what they're lacking, so they think they, they have it all. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody that, said, that thinks they know it all. Right? You, they know everything. You can't tell them nothing. They think they know everything. Right? Um, and, and they're missing the wisdom. That's how you know wisdom's not there. Because wisdom says, let me be quiet and let me listen to what I hear. Uh, and then let me digest what I'm hearing um, by praying on it. And, and I don't say everything people say to you is always right. But sometimes we got to be... <laughs> See, the Lord's trying to talk and say something to us. Sometimes we have to be quiet and listen. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, and then take what we, what we have heard and really meditate on it, digest it, pray about it, and ask God, you know, to uh, really make it, um, you know, evident uh, in your life, if that's what the Lord is really saying to you. So uh, let's leave it there. I think that's the, the cutoff time. All right, let's pray. Almighty God.